Hello friends, welcome back to our Audioholics YouTube channel. I'm Gene Delasala, I'm president of Audioholics, and today we have Higo Rivera, Vice President of Marketing. Gene, today we're gonna be talking about Dolby Atmos again, because we have promised our audience that once we do some good listening tests and some awesome measurements, mm -hmm. we'll come back and we'll explain more about how the, the speakers work. We're going to do a lot of coverage of Atmos, so don't expect this to be the last one either. Yes, <laughs> you're correct. Yeah, we're getting the Transformers tomorrow. That's that should right. should be interesting. We are. We're going to be getting the Transformers disc. So today what I'd like to talk about is, you know, we, we shot a video talking about the Dolby Atmos elevation speaker. And because it's all Roswell technology, nobody likes to talk about what's inside of them. We made some assumptions. You know, I assumed that the human-related transfer function response that Dolby is using was built into the receiver and not in the crossover. Well, facepalm, man. It was worse than we thought. Yeah, it looks to me, I mean, I took apart one of these uh, Atmos speakers, the A60 DefTech. Um, they have a very complex crossover in it and I got a look at the Dolby patent, the crossover on that. And man, they're trying to do frequency response shaping with the human related transfer function almost purely in the analog domain. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as I always said before, and as everyone, any engineer would tell you, if you're doing this kind of frequency response manipulation with high Q type of dips and nulls, you wanna do that in the digital domain. You don't wanna do that in the analog domain. I just don't understand in this day and age why anyone would try to do that unless they're just trying to come up with a reason to patent something. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, Dolby is using an extremely complex crossover network to do this human-related transfer function response. It's actually an eight-element crossover, Hugo. Mm -hmm. It's got three inductors, three capacitors, two resistors, and the way they draw it in the patent, it's like it makes you cross-eyed, so <laughs> show them the patent crossover and then show them the way I redrew it that most engineers would better relate to. Yeah, your, your way is definitely much more clear. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing is they have, you know, they're basically manipulating, um, they're putting a bump at 7 kilohertz and a dip at 12 kilohertz. Now, if you look at the patent, in some areas it says the bump should be, what, 2 dB? Mm -hmm. Then I see in another one it should be 5 dB, five. okay? Mm -hmm. Then you look at the 12 kilohertz dip, that should be like 5 dB or, or 7 dB or 4 dB. It's like, it's not consistent, yeah, okay? Correct. But if you look at the actual response that's in the crossover circuit, it's the more conservative one. It's the 2 dB bump and the 4 dB dip. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's be real here, okay? Who's gonna hear a 2 dB bump at seven kilohertz? And who's gonna hear a 4 dB dip at 12 kilohertz? So Hugo, I mean, at 12 kilohertz, what's the wavelength at 12 kilohertz? Something like around one inch or something yeah. like that? Yeah, all right, so it's one inch. That means the path difference is about a half an inch, mm -hmm. okay? What's the distance between the average ears? Gosh, between four to six inches or something? Okay, so I mean, just going like this, going like that, you're not gonna hear the null. I mean, I've talked extensively to Dr. Tool about this too. I mean, it's, you know, the human-related transfer function, he even presented this at Cedia, that what they're using for that uh, curve, it's not really based on a science that is conductive with elevated sound. Right. So you're wondering why they even have that. I mean, we have that transfer function already built into our heads and it's different for every person. Right. But it just threw me for a loop because I never thought they would actually put that into the crossover. And you know, from what we measured here, it's a huge limiting factor to the performance of the product. Because mm -hmm. they're not doing anything about time or phase domain analysis, they're just doing frequency response manipulation. Right. And if you look at the measurements of this, particularly of this speaker, they're barely hitting their target. Okay, I mean, uh, the, the bump is like, I think I measured eight kilohertz instead of seven, and the, the notch is so narrow and so low in amplitude, <clears throat> and it's just, you know, in reality, that it's not really doing much of anything, okay? Right. I mean, I, I did some P-SPICE analysis, and, and uh, if you change the variable of the, of, if you change the DCR of the uh, speaker, or if you change LE, the inductance, it changes that whole response because Dolby won't let you change the values as far as right. I, as far as we know, those values are fixed. So you gotta use a specific driver that has a specific DC resistance, that has a, a specific inductance. Then you gotta make sure your parts have pretty tight tolerances or that's gonna be all over the map too. All this can be avoided if you do it in the digital domain. Right. So it, it kind of scares me because, you know, this isn't the greatest example of an Atmos speaker. There's some better ones out there like the coax, versions from, Do from um, 
Pioneer and from mm -hmm. Atlantic Tech, but they're all stuck with using this crossover. Yeah, the, when you say better, it's really confined within the limits of what this allows. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the bottleneck in this case. Yeah. In my opinion, that's a bottleneck. And, you know, I just, I don't think that's a good approach personally. Right. Our listening tests bear that out once you get it in the home. They were definitely a limiting factor when it came to the whole sound experience, you know? Yeah, I mean, when we stuck the Atmos modules on, I was like, uh, you know, it had some elevated effects for the high frequency stuff, mm -hmm. but the broadband stuff, which is what most of the Dolby Upsampler is doing when you're taking two-channel music or you're taking uh, regular true HD surround sound stuff, there's a lot of background steady state sound, your head's drawn to that speaker. Yes. And if you sit too close, it's too localized. If you sit too far away, that height effect collapses. Mm -hmm. Now, when you put the speakers on the ceiling, you don't have that problem as much. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think the experience is tremendously better when you use ceiling mounted speakers as opposed to this patented Atmos speaker. Well, and I think Atmos as a technology gene, and correct me if I'm wrong, really was designed when you have discrete speakers, you know, that are elevated. Right, I agree with you yeah. on that. I don't think uh, I don't think they ever thought about you know a situation where you have a speaker that was trying to reflect and bounce off sound waves. And let's keep in mind that we're still you know our listening tests were done with us at the sweet spot. We're not discussing the fact that the rest of the people may be hearing something completely different. Yeah, it's very. I found it to be very inconsistent. I have a two-row theater room um, in our showcase house. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that, you know, I could get good sound from all the speakers, but the most inconsistent result was, depending on where I was sitting, was a result of these Atmos modules. Right. The, the funny thing, I think, um, which is actually kind of tragic, is the fact that, you know, your sister-in-law, she thought that when the speakers were turned off, that's when they were enabled. Yeah, and she did the blind test, and she mm -hmm. actually preferred the focus sound without Atmos. This was for music, by mm -hmm. the way. She preferred the Atmos or the non-Atmos version when we were listening to music, and that was the Bailando video uh, from the Dolby Demo Disc, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, there's some limiting factors here, and uh, the patents, it's, it's a hit or miss for me. I mean, it's cool that they came out with this concept. It's cool that they have a, a solution to introduce people that can't put a discrete speaker on the ceiling, but just realize there's some lim severe limitations here, and it's not compatible with competing formats like Oro 3, 3D, and I don't know about the DTS version that's coming out next because that's not disclosed yet either. Based on everything we've seen, Gene, do you feel that this is the greatest advancement in the last 20 years in the audio industry? This speaker is definitely not. I mean, I think the speaker takes you back significantly in fidelity. As far as Dolby Atmos, I think it's a great advancement in the cinema and for upscale theaters, but no way is this the greatest advancement in audio in 20 years. I just think that's marketing BS. I agree. I think going from two channel to discrete five channel, like Dolby Digital, was one of the significant steps. And then a significant step up above that was True HD because it was, un it was lossless and the sound quality was as good. You had stereo sound quality, CD sound quality in every channel or better. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge, for audiophiles, that was the biggest breakthrough, in my opinion, in yeah. 20 years. Not Atmos. Atmos is just icing on the cake, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. At, at least in the home theater, the way it's being implemented now. Yeah, meaning with, like, you know, the reflective speakers, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, I, yes. I, I, I expected more out of this. I know we took a little heat on our first video, but you know what? I stand by everything we said in that first video. You know what, at the end of the day, it, it was all based on science, you know, high school physics, really. Yeah. I mean, not even our engineering physics from college. No, I mean, I mean what do you I think? Mean, if you want to have sound in a well, certain area, what do you think is the best way to do it? Well, Gene, I mean, if you want sound coming from a specific location, you put a speaker in that location. Exactly. There are no exceptions to that rule. Right, I agree. So, you know, you want the sound waves from there, put the speaker there, that's it. Yeah. You I know? mean, we do that with every other channel, so why would the height channels be an exception? Exactly. That's the bottom line. So hopefully, you know, people will understand our point. Yes. And, you know, you know, if you want more details on this, I did hand calculations. I, I, I uh, did the transfer function of this crossover. I took it apart. I did piece by analysis. I went back to my engineering days and I, you know, I, I, I did a little analysis for propeller heads that want to see that. But the bottom line is, you know, it's it is what it is. Exactly. Don't shoot the messenger. Right. <laughs> Awesome, Gene. I think we pretty much covered this subject unless you have anything else to add. I'm good. Awesome. Well, with that said, 
I want to invite our listeners and viewers to go ahead and check us out at audioholics.com where we have tons of more myth busting articles over there and tons of reviews. And also, if you uh, like this video, don't keep it to yourself. Go ahead and share it with everybody else. Click like on the button below and feel free to comment as well. And also, if you visit our site, make sure that you sign up to our free weekly newsletter that we send at least once a week. And we also give you a really cool ebook on our top uh, 2014, which will be, soon be the 2015 AV Gear Guide. So be sure to sign up. And until next time, keep, keep listening. listening.